I first saw Alsace in Paris at a little cinema in the Marais around the corner from my hotel. I'd been reading a review of the film on the train from another city to Paris in the Herald Tribune, and by chance the thing was playing on the same day I arrived, so I had a chance to go and see it. I was very, very impressed by it, and in a way surprised, I suppose, because I'd never heard of the director before. What really struck me first about the film, before the narrative, before the character delineation or any of that, was the photographic style, the picture-making part of the film. The camera work was slow in that there's not much camera movement, and I would consider heavy. It seemed like the camera that was being used in the film was a very heavy one, locked down often on a tripod, rooted to the floor of the room in which the action was taking place. The shots were often allowed to extend in time quite long, often longer than one would have expected them to, and that also created a sense of heaviness and slowness of time and space, emotion, and of even of nature and of the city. That was combined with the insistent sounds coming from somewhere outside of the space where the picture was being made. Dogs barking, other people talking, clatter of people going by, automobiles and so on, which penetrates the, all the little rooms and spaces of the neighborhood where most of the action takes place. The combination of the slowness, squareness, heaviness, rectangularity of the framing and the picture making with the fractured, erratic, random soundscape was very original and I was fascinated by it. I'm not good with scenarios, I'm a photographer, but the scenario of uh, Olsus is interesting because it's not too clear, it's not too organized. In a lot of standard filmmaking, every character who appears, every object that appears, every event that takes place is dedicated to the clarification and resolution of some kind of plot, some story with some aim. What's striking about Alsos is that is often not the case. There are characters in the film who do nothing, who almost don't participate in the story at all. They are present in repeated shots, but don't do anything, occasionally listen to the conversation of other people, observe the action, and disappear. They're not background figures, they're not extras. They seem to be very important, and yet they don't have any material effect on the course of the action. I found that striking as well, that sense that life was too complex to be included in the film as a whole, that the film allowed for the fact that energy, consciousness, interest, and so on would escape it. And Costa found a way, I think, that made it clear, or at least expressed, the fact that aspects of the story, aspects of these people's lives, aspects of the life of the neighborhood, aspects of that group of conflicted and conflicting people, aspects of their lives would never be encapsulated or encompassed or expressed in his film, but would be present in their mode of escaping from it. There's a character, a young woman, who I only identified as the watcher. I believe she's in the first shot of the film, doing nothing but looking toward the camera. She appears repeatedly watching things, listening, and I think once listening to a conversation from quite close uh, to it. She never appears to have any effect or participation in it, and yet brings an energy from outside to the story, toward the story, but not necessarily into the story. I see that as a, as a kind of interruption of the story or a way of pausing the onward movement of the narrative to allow us viewers to experience it differently, to experience it as if we could suddenly filter ourselves or divert ourselves to the outside of the narrative and be on another street, in another room, hearing only about what happened to these people, hearing only a rumor about it, possibly, never really experiencing it directly, and yet knowing something about it. The enigmatic figures 
like the Watcher, seem to mark the whole film in that all the characters are enigmatic. We don't really get to know much about them. I think they remain pretty strange to us, like strangers. In a lot of films, it seems that the filmmakers are trying to get us to know something about people, to get closer to them, to be able to peer into their souls in some way. And some of those films are really great, like Bergman, for example, in some of his films where we feel that we really can sense the inner life, the inner being of people. In Costa's film, something else is taking place. It's neither better than the kind I've just mentioned, nor worse. It's just different and also very good. It's a situation where, although we're very close to people, we observe them closely over a considerable time, watch them go through an important experience. We don't really feel that we've entered into their consciousness or into their personality in any way. We don't really know them. They remain as strange to us at the end of the film as they were when we first encountered them. Clotilde, who's the most important figure, I think, in also the central figure, is typical of one that remains very strange to me. I got used to things like her unusual, slightly rigid, tense, and stiff walk as she moved from place to place. Her body movements were very striking, very original. I have no idea how she had created those, whether they're just natural to the actress or whether they're some kind of performance. I don't know. But they became very familiar. Some of her attitudes, some of her ideas, some of her feelings were depicted. But she remained to me a real mystery, a person I don't think I could know from the way she was depicted. But there's something grand about that strangeness, something important about it, that I think reaches deep into what depictions really are, or at least what's really interesting about depictions in film or drawing or painting or photography or, I suppose, in literature too. That is that we can't really possess the subjects of depictions. We can't really get conscious control of understanding them in any way. They always remain other, somewhat distant from us, somewhat remote. I'm interested in that as an artistic quality, and I think that it's very marked in Ossos. It's something that I hadn't been looking for in the film, but was very impressed by as I recognized the consistency with which that enigmatic quality, that continuous enigmatic quality was maintained throughout the picture, throughout the film. I think all of the characters are depicted that way and our relation to, to all of them in varying degrees of intensity is like that. Nurse Edwarda, who is again an important and compelling character in the film, may be a slight exception to that in the sense that in the latter part of the film when she visits the neighborhood where Clotilde and Tina and the others live, and she becomes involved with uh, Clotilde's husband, she betrays aspects of her character by gesture and facial expression that are somewhat surprising given her previous behavior. And at that point, I had a sense that I was getting an insight into an inner character of a person that I hadn't really had from any of the others, really. That may be an exception in the depictions in the film. I'm not sure, but it was striking and in that sense, rather disturbing. When I saw Osos that first time, I was immediately reminded of the later films by Robert Bresson, the ones done in color. And I had the feeling that Pedro Costa was a very close and attentive student of uh, Bresson. The combination of realism and a very detached, even metaphysical sort of poetry that we find in, uh, in the best aspects, at least, of Bresson's films, seem to have been very central to the kind of pictures and kind of sounds that Pedro Costa wanted to record and put on film. That kind of quiet but intense poetry that looks at every object in the world, every face, every animal, in an almost equal way, or at least a way that finds equal interest in a coffee pot, the tiling behind a stove, someone's hair, what's hanging in a doorway, the jacket a child's wearing, whatever it might be, a tree coming across the road. 
all those things combine together to make a kind of vision that corresponds closely to, I think, the way we see the world normally and transmits it to us in an intensified way that sometimes shows us what it's like to have an experience. Sometimes I think of works of art, films, pictures, as making it possible for us to experience what it's like to have experiences. The tradition of rather minimal, but rather austere, rather poetic, but at the same time very reportage-based or documentary-looking films that we identify so strongly with uh, director like Robert Bresson seems to me to be one of the central cinematic and artistic traditions. In the later films of Bresson, which I think resemble uh, also in many ways, many of the characters are tormented, many of them are young, and they are involved in rather complicated relationships. This we see also in Costa's film. I have the feeling, however, that in Bresson, in films like L'Argent, for example, Bresson has created not so much living people anymore as very intensely realized and intensely imagined abstractions or types. Sometimes I, I think of them as almost celestial beings who act out the drama to create the meaning and give the feeling that Bresson wanted. And yet at the same time, they are rather bloodless sometimes, like angels or abstractions. Although one always admires that kind of filmmaking, and his films in particular, that's always been one aspect of at least his later films that has bothered me, or at least left me unsatisfied, or made me feel that for all his greatness as an artist, the direction in which his work developed was not one that I would have taken it in. Costa's film seems to correct that, if it's possible to put it that way, adding to the intensity that we find in the, the older filmmaker's work, a sense of the uncleanliness, disorder, noisiness, distractedness of the real world, something that I think Bresson was interested in eliminating for important purposes, but which nevertheless seems to me to be every bit as important and significant as its absence. I think a little bit of dog shit on the pavement of a street, some garbage in the corner, a smudge on a jacket, or an unkempt hairstyle is as deeply meaningful and deeply abstract as a more swept out, organized, clarified, simplified, and abstracted vision. And I have a feeling that Costa sees it that way too.